the idea of symbiosis and like the hollow genome theory, which we can uh, uh, get into later, is this concept that like different organisms are interacting with each other, of course, and many people are kind of aware of this. However, because of the way we use these terms, kind of like what you're saying, there are some there are some misconstruing, you know, factors. Basically, we think that symbiosis means only positive things a lot of times. Many times people use this word that way, but it's actually not the case. Um, like you pointed out, symbiosis is all the interactions. That's the ones that are mutualistic. So one benefits and the other benefits. One where it's parasitic. One benefits at the expense of the other one. Sometimes they're common solid or amen solid. You know, where one benefits, but the other one isn't really affected. You know, there are these various interactions that, that have been documented. Sometimes they are hard to classify for various organisms because life is very complex. But, you know, when you understand that this is the case, you also understand how, for example, in this case, plants interact with things like their microbiota in the soil inside themselves as endophytes on their surface in the phylosphere where the leaves are. These are all places where those microbes can be, but also various organisms like insects and mites and even uh, sort of vertebrates and mammals and birds and things like this as well. And they are connected in this very uh, complicated way. But another part of this, I think, comes from a sort of a stereotype about how we view the environment and nature. Mm. Without being too long-winded, it's kind of like this perspective that like everything in the natural world is living in harmony. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, depending on your view of what harmonious means, that could very well still be true. Sure. But uh, I think people have like a, a sort of a, a Looney Tunes or maybe fairy tale perspective. A, a romanticized version of nature, which is often brutal and unforgiving and cruel if we are going to personify it in that. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, although maybe that is also perhaps swinging too far to the other extreme. But yes, you are right. It is often this way. It is often brutal and cruel. And it is not like, for example, plants. You know, people think that all the plants in the forest are like working together. And like all of them, the mushrooms and the microbes are all helping each other out. <laughs> that's, a, that's a small fraction of what's happening. Sure. There's examples of both, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like plants are constantly competing with each other, even their own kin for resources, for resources in the soil, for sunlight, you know, the ultimate resource for a lot of these plants. We know that, um, for example, when plants, if they do uh, have relationships with certain microbes, over time they co-evolve and, you know, you'll have this relationship like with mycorrhiza, maybe many people know this, a lot of mycorrhizae, they form a relationship, but most people, they only think of the benefits of the plant, but they're not thinking about what the plant has to do to accommodate this organism. Right, right, that does make sense. For example, I just wanted to say, like, just to answer that question in people's head, you know, the mycorrhiza might provide things like a, like a nutrient, like phosphorus, or maybe even better hydration for the plant, which is incredibly critical. Gives you that edge. But the plant also has to produce something for the mycorrhiza. And that's usually the case of some sort of sugar, mm -hmm. part of its photosynthate, some part of its precious photosynthate from photosynthesis. So it's not like the plant doesn't give something in return. Not only that, it has to be able to discriminate between the good things and the bad things. It's not magic. There's a lot of like genetic and molecular signaling that's happening. And it's not always, a, well, I wouldn't say it's always sort of a consensual even. So like you're saying, it's not this perfect, harmonious exchange. There's a lot of give and take. There's a lot of economics going on, sometimes lopsided economics. Definitely. And also the environmental context can make a mutualism, a parasitism in certain contexts. Or at the very least, you might describe it like it's not as beneficial. That does happen. Can we get some specific examples of that? You know, I've heard of things like... Um, uh, springtails. Oh, they're harmless. They're harmless. And then other times if they get too hungry or too out of control, they'll begin eating the roots. Is that kind of like what you're talking about? It is kind of like what I'm talking about. So like, here's another sort of esoteric example. Um, I've posted about it a lot, not because I think it's like a, a massive threat, 
but because it it drives home a point, which is this idea. This is concept called mycorrhiza induced susceptibility, and it's what happens when certain mycorrhiza, in fact, various mycorrhiza that are often used in products that are meant to benefit plants, like uh, rhizophagus regularis. In fact, that's a big one. So the benefits that people are talking about. Ah, uh, no. Let me finish my thought this way, and then I'll explain. Sure. Basically, when the mycorrhiza inoculates the plant, in some cases, this can actually cause the plant to be more susceptible to certain things. And in this case, it's usually viruses that I've seen documented about. Like it'll increase their viral titer, which just is a fancy way of saying there's more of those particles in the system. It might uh, make the symptoms more severe. It might lower the resistance of the plant to these viruses, which plants typically don't have a really great batting rate against in general if、right. they are colonized. So why is that? Well, the reason for that is because when we talk about and tout the benefits of certain microbes in the soil, it's not like it's coming again magically to the plant. What's happening is that the plant's immune system is being primed. And also modulate in other ways. In fact, a lot of microbes that are beneficial or mutualistic that go into the plant to some degree, or even exist on the surface, they have to bypass somehow navigate the immune system of that plant. And sometimes they do this through signals. Sometimes they do this through literally reprogramming the genetic expression of the cells that they come into contact with, which happens a lot with mycorrhiza. And They enter in, and then they kind of, you know, they kind of break in, and they start saying like, "Okay, here's some phosphorus. Okay, give me that hexos," and、um, you know, like there's、wow. this bypass of the immune system that that's occurring, and there's also priming of the immune system because of their very presence. The plant has a reaction to the chitin in the fungal cells or the various compounds that are being produced. Sometimes the fungus even produces compounds that are beneficial. To the plant itself, but ultimately, this is what's happening, and that's really important to note because obviously, that could be a negative in another potential context, like for example, plant virus、uh, inoculation, or some other sort of microbe that uses a similar pathway to attack the plant. So, I hopefully that kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, I, I think that the layperson like myself is going to understand that just as, about as well as I could. From that explanation,、um, and that's what you're referring to as far as this hollow genome, right? That's right. So, you know, hollow genome theory is rather recent. It still has some. There's still some contention about maybe some of the specifics. And of course, when you have theories like this, you know, for one thing, calling it the hollow genome theory, it's there's a lot of evidence for it. There's a lot of supporting evidence for it. That's why it's termed this way. But of course, there are some specifics that are still kind of being sort of beat out. And the hollow genome theory basically is this idea that you have all of the genomes, all of、uh, of an environment, of an,、uh, you know,、uh, a bio, right? So like that could be a plant body, it could be a human body, it could be a forest, it could be the entire earth, you know, it could be、right. a leaf, right? And it's all the genomes in that. Space that are all interacting with each other, you know, just a bunch of barcodes in their body is kind of like,、Jeez. you know, intermingling. And there's like mobile genetic elements that move across species. There's horizontal gene transfer that happens quite a bit, especially with microbes and insects, for example. So, so this very, all these things are happening. And there's also this topic called the、uh, the phylosymbiosis theory, which is also the observation that. Organisms that are closer in relation to each other have similar microbiomes, and organisms that are more disparate have less similar, generally speaking. And there's a lot of interesting things to pull from that as we learn more about how microbes even affect our own body. <laughs>